Hi there, and welcome to another edition of the 1% Better Podcast with your host, Rob O'Donoghue. Hey folks, welcome to another episode of the 1% Better Podcast. And in this episode, I am talking with, over Skype, uh, Megan Duhamel. So Megan, welcome to the podcast. It's uh, great to, to finally connect with you. Yeah, thanks for having me and being patient with my schedule. <laughs> <laughs> not not at all. Obviously, when it, it, it's a rare treat that I get to talk to somebody that has Olympic gold medals, seven-time national champion, two-world time champion, um, lots of accolades behind your name. So I'm certainly very flexible when it comes to schedules from that perspective so <laughs> so thanks so much for uh, for taking the time out i know you're um i know you're in a coffee shop there and i also know just when we talked offline your your voice is is, is strained a little bit so I, I hope that it'll see us through the next 50 minutes or so yeah i think it's going to be fine it's just people will be stuck listening to a bit of a raspy voice it's kind of um gone permanently raspy the last two weeks as i've been busy coaching and and running skating workshops yeah, no, no, no problem at all. I'm sure it'll be well received, no matter how it sounds. <laughs> um, so, so Megan, definitely want to get into your successes in your career. And I know, I think from the research since around 2008, you became vegan. Is that is that correct? Yeah, December 2008. Okay, so I'd definitely like to learn a little bit about that. I think when we connected, I probably plagued you on on twitter uh, for for a while before <laughs> we were able to connect and uh mm-hmm. i noticed the vegan piece which was fascinating just from uh, you know how you train and certainly how how you keep energy levels up so i'd like to learn a little bit about that um but maybe just mm-hmm. take it right back when you were i, I always like to ask guests on, on the one percent better show what's their earliest memory and what comes up for them when i put them on the spot what, what comes up for you when when you think of that oh uh. I, I have an interesting earliest memory, actually. Mm. Um, one of my first memories was when I was three. I must have been two and a half or three years old. And um, my dad used to own a driving range uh, where people can practice hitting golf balls. Very good. And at the end of the day, he would let my sister and I practice hitting some balls um, as he cleaned up and, and closed up shop for the day. And I happened to be picking up a ball, a golf ball. As my sister was swinging and she hit me in the face with her golf club and I lost all my front teeth. Um, And I just have this memory of my dad carrying me in his arms, running home to my mom saying, what do we do? What do we do? And my mouth was full of blood. Uh, And that's, that's my first memory. It was pretty traumatic. (laughs) There was was a, there was a sport link to your first memory memory as well. (laughs) So did, did that potentially turn you off golf for the rest of your life? You know what? I play golf a little bit now, but um, I don't go to driving ranges very often. And <laughs> when I do, I always uh, make sure that the bucket of balls is on the correct side. Because I guess what happened then is that um, I was reaching for the wrong bucket of balls. You should always be going the opposite direction mm-hmm. that the person beside you is swinging. Yeah. So that was a bit scary. <laughs> so when I when I um, I probably have bad memories when I was growing up of swimming, and I'm not a great swimmer, so I probably have a, that fear of of swimming pools. You probably have a similar terror when you see uh, <laughs> driving ranges. Um, yes. but that's, that's very interesting. So so obviously, then did skating become something of focus at a, at a very young age? It did. Um, I mean, I was already skating about that time uh, mm. since I was three years old. I was on the ice. Everybody in my family and my extended family, they seem to always be at the ice rink, skating or playing hockey. My dad played hockey. My uncles played hockey. Um, my sister skated. My aunt taught skating lessons. Uh, I'm from a really small town in northern Ontario, and we have outdoor ice rinks all over the place. Mm-hmm. So I was just surrounded by ice. And apart from that golfing accident, I don't have very many memories in my childhood um, that were involving anything but ice. Um, I loved to be a drink and I loved uh, to learn and follow my older sister. That was one of the reasons I really got latched on to figure skating was because my older sister was skating. Mm. And was she many years older? Was she much more advanced on, on the ice? And, you know, is that why you c- kind of followed her? Exactly. Yeah. She's two years older than me. And I, I mean, I wanted to follow her everywhere, everything that she did um, in life. You know, I was kind of a bratty little sister, like most younger siblings I guess are um but my sister she was more advanced than me 
And I just wanted to do everything she could do. So I would kind of like teach myself the things that she was learning with her coach. And when I was five years old, my mom registered my sister for a summer skating camp. But I was too young to attend the camp because I was only five. But um, my mom kind of begged begged and pleaded the summer skating school, please take take my other daughter. She's going to be really upset if she can't be involved. Um, so they made an exception and they allowed me into the camp. <laughs> Very good. I've, I've talked to other folks in the past that have been successful in sport and in, in different, I suppose, arenas in the sporting world. And I, for some reason, it's, it's coming up that they've, their older brother or older sister was one of the reasons why they, they got so interested and and it seems like maybe more often than not the younger in your case you maybe became more advanced or, or more successful in in that sport did your sister go far in in the skating world or was it you know did you start to develop much faster than her at an early age um my sister went pretty far she competed at the national level okay um and we competed against each other for mm. for a year and the year that we competed against each other, she qualified for nationals and I didn't. Um, but eventually it got to a point where I was from a really small town. And in order to be successful, I needed to move away from home to, to have more elite coaching and be in a, a more elite training environment. And when we got to that point, I wanted to move away and have better coaching and a better training environment. And my sister didn't have that same determination. She wanted to stay at home with her friends. So that was kind of what divided us on two different paths in our sporting careers. Oh. And and that was around, what age were you then, around 14 or 15? Yeah, I was 14 when I, I made the decision really on my own and I told my parents that this was what I needed to do if I wanted to go to the Olympics. Because I had it kind of set in my head since I was about six or seven that I was going to go to the Olympics. And, you know, I was really the driving force in that. My parents didn't know much about the sport um, nor did they really want me to be moving away and spending all this money in this sport um, where success is so uncertain. Mm. But, uh, you know, I was so determined and so motivated that they kind of had no choice but to let me go. <laughs> and I think they're happy now that they did it. <laughs> yeah, no, it so- sounds like it. I, so that level of motivation, self-belief at that young age, where do you think that came from? Oh, you know, I've, like, I've reflected on that a lot and I don't, I don't know exactly what it was, but when I was six or seven years old, I was already telling people I was going to the Olympics. And my mom would tell me, you know, maybe you shouldn't say that to people. It kind of sounds silly to not to announce that you want to. I would say I am going like it wasn't even a question, but I believed it. I believed that I was going to do it. And I really started studying the sport at that age. I read everything about the sport. I read stories of successful athletes and then I would try to emulate their life and copy what they did because I thought well they were successful because they did this so I'm going to copy them and and I just skating kind of became my drug of choice I guess you can say and I was addicted to it and so focused on that goal of going to the Olympics wow it's certainly it seems like so you you don't have a uh, a point in time when maybe somebody planted a seed in your mind to say you have great talent you could go all the way was there any moment like that was there an early coach that stood out or something like that um I, you know I had really great coaches but no one that looked at me and said wow you can be a champion because I wasn't really that talented I kind of had these crazy dreams without without the talent <laughs> to back it up that much um of course, I was talented, but I wasn't winning every competition in my age category. You know, I wasn't always winning medals and winning. But um, at one point, uh, somebody told my mom that I had potential and that if I wanted to make it far, we needed to begin, become more invested with better coaching and better choreographers. And my mom felt like people were just lying to her, that people, you know, you always want to believe your child has talent. But my mom didn't want to be lied to. And so she called, my mom called a judge and asked this judge, does my daughter really have talent or am I wasting my time? And um, the judge told my mom that, that yes, I had potential. And then my mom started to take it more seriously after that. Right. So that was a good, uh, a good idea from your mom to, to, to get some validation there. <laughs> well, she, didn't, she didn't want people to just kind of be taking her money or to be like, dragging us along with this false hope 
she wanted to know like is it real does my daughter really have talent or are we wasting our time and our money sure. um which i mean if that's a valid thing but oh. it's very it's very uncommon i've never heard of a parent calling a judge you know like this is unheard of in our sport so that was a little bit uh, of a funny story that my mom had gone out and done but i don't remember um at a young age anybody telling me like oh if you work really hard you can go to the olympics it was mm-hmm. me who came up with that i watched the olympics on tv and i told my mom if i work hard i'm gonna go there and i told my coaches oh i'm gonna work really hard so i can go to the olympics um it was always coming from me it was no one around me was feeding it to me at all mm. and was that single-mindedness on skating like were you as determined in other parts of your your life growing up or, or subsequently to be successful and and that laser focus or or had it just been that one thing from that early age it's i'd love to say it's everything (laughs) like that i was like this in school but i wasn't it was purely in sport and in skating that's what i was driven to do and i did all my projects at school as a child on skating and on the olympics and um it's it's what i cared about the most it's what i still care about the most yeah no no it's 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 great it's, it's it's really cool to hear that that focus and determination and as you said not always you know you'd hear that statement regularly about talent and hard work you know the hard work is is very much key or 90 percent of 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 the success so so when you, when you managed to convince your your parents that this was going to be your destiny and they 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 agreed mm-hmm sacrifices that were made around then what what jumps out out when you think of that um well i mean i I moved away from home when i was 14 Mm -hmm. and for a few years i lived with with different families um in this town it was three hours away from my hometown Mm -hmm. in barry ontario um and you know at one point i was living on somebody's pull-out couch because we couldn't afford um a big space i was living in a one-bedroom apartment with a married couple and i was just on their couch And that's all we could afford. Um, Skating is a really expensive sport. Equipment, costumes, ice time, coaching. And then on top of it all, we had to pay for me to live with another family, a couple hundred dollars a month. Mm. Um, So, I mean, it was really, really expensive. And my parents had two other kids at home. I have a younger brother as well. Um, And for about two or three years, my parents both had two jobs. And they were working from seven in the morning until midnight. Uh, my brother and sister would spend time with my grandparents uh, while my parents were working just to, to keep to keep me afloat in the skating world and to be able to pay my coaches and pay for my costumes and pay for my travel as I was starting to travel all over the world for events. Um, that was a huge sacrifice for my entire family, not just for me. Sure. My parents never demanded any, like they never said, we're doing this because you're going to the Olympics. Mm. Um, they They wanted me to reach as far as I could and for me to reach my potential. And they were trying to give me every opportunity that they could. Um, and as they did that, I continued to work hard and stay fo- focused on my goals so that, you know, one day it w- would all be worth it. As the the years started to, to go by from, you know, from the ages of 14 onwards, was your progression uh, kind of going linearly upwards? You know, was, was it, incremental was there um i suppose any points along that journey where you were thinking maybe this isn't going to happen or you you lost some of that belief um definitely i mean it was like it was up and down um right away after i moved away from home uh you know i everything was moving steadily up up uh pace um i was qualifying for international competitions i won the canadian nationals at the junior level So we were seeing success. Um, I competed at the World Junior Championships. I was selected to represent Canada two or three times a year at various international events. Um, So, you know, things seemed to be steadily moving along. Uh, I wouldn't say like extremely quickly, but it was like a slow and steady climb. Mm -hmm. Um, And in 2006, I went to the national championships, which is also the Olympic qualification. And um, that was a major setback because I had a chance to qualify for the Olympic team and two girls would qualify from Canada. At this point, I was skating as a single skater, not with a partner. Right. And I finished fourth. So I just missed the qualification for the Olympics. Right. 
and that was a huge setback that kind of made me and forced me to to readdress what I was doing and to think like maybe I have reached as far as I can go maybe it's time to go back to school maybe it's time to focus on something else and stop wasting all this money mm. um but as soon as I started thinking you know outside of the sport something was always drawing me back in like no the olympics is in four more years you have another chance you'll get another chance you can do it again um but i think 2006 was a really big turning point for me in my career mm. so the actual coming forth was more of, even more of a catalyst to drive you further forward and give you that i suppose refocus uh, do you think that was the key piece that was the key piece and what happened after that um that olympic season was that i was asked to move to montreal to skate paris with a guy named craig bunton mm -hmm. and that's when my career really took off when i really started focusing on skating pairs instead of skating singles i made the move to new coaches in montreal and i kind of took ownership for my own career i had to work and pay for my own skating my parents were no longer financially supporting me right um you know, I moved to Montreal, I got a full-time job, I started training. Yeah, and in, then in 2008, um, I was already ranked second in Canada and sixth in the world. So things had started to climb back up higher than I'd ever reached. So I was seeing the Olympics more clearly and the goal to get there was closer and it was within reach. And at that point, I had started taking ownership for my own career working and paying for my own expenses and my parents were no longer financially supporting me. So that was a big change for myself. How, how did the, how did it change going from skating single to with, with Craig? I suppose, how did you deal with that? Was that something that made you more determined? Did it have an impact on you that you were no longer an individual? You were kind of a team of two. It was a pretty smooth transition for me. Because I had been kind of at a crossroads and I was ready for a change. Right. So I really embraced that change. Um, but, you know, there's, there was a lot of uh, times where I had to, to learn some lessons of, about how to communicate on a team, have good teamwork skills, adapting to another person. Um, it didn't matter if I felt 100%. If my partner didn't feel 100%, we wouldn't skate our best and perform our best. But in those first years that I became a pair skater um, but the most valuable lessons were really about teamwork and how to communicate you were I'm just reading again just doing a little bit of research when you were skating with Craig there was was there a couple of these sort of accidents happen when you're skating with some some partner injuries occur did was there a couple of incidents that happened that that, that is, is that typical yeah well we had um we had one accident at a competition in France and these type of things I mean, they're really typical. It's um, um, very rarely something serious. Um, but we were at a competition and uh, just in simple choreography, it wasn't even on a big risky element. Um, Craig's hand was in front of him instead of beside him. And I was too close to him and, and I kicked him with my blade and, and cut his hand. Um, we get a, ded a deduction for stopping in a competition. Right. So we took the deduction to quickly stop and get his hand wrapped up so that we could finish our performance. And by the end of the performance, you know, the blood had kind of seeped through the wrapping and all onto my dress and <laughs> all over the ice. Um, and it, it looked really dramatic, but it was really funny that, uh, that evening, uh, Craig went to the doctors and got, went to get stitches and he only required one stitch. So it was such a minor thing <laughs> that caused so much drama. Uh. And, um, he was so embarrassed after, when people asked him, oh, what happened? Can I see your hand? It must look terrible. And he had like one little suture. Oh, God. <laughs> He'd be like, oh, like it was really bad, but it didn't turn out to be that bad at the end of the day. Um, mm. It's kind of a funny story. Dramatic effect on, on that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very <laughs> on the ice, it was really dramatic. It bled a lot. But um, in the end, he just needed one tiny stitch. Yeah. The blood on the ice, I suppose, probably makes it look pretty cool. I, I'll, I'll cut out the part where he only needed a one tiny stitch here. I don't want to, to ruin that story for, for people. <laughs> um, so I read then you were close to retiring after that. Was that what, what was going through your mind at that point? Did Again, was it another inflection point? Yeah, um, that was another huge turning point for me. Um, I guess the most pivotal in my life. Um, 
Craig and I skated together for three years. And in those three years, we finished sixth in the world and eighth in the world and as high as second in Canada. Um, the Olympics were coming to Canada in 2010 in Vancouver. And this is uh, was Craig's hometown. So this was why we started skating together was to be at the Olympics in Vancouver. Um, th two pair teams could represent Canada at the Olympics. And in 2009, we were second in Canada. So, you know, we were in that spot to go to the Olympics. And we went to the Olympic qualification. Um, I was dealing with a lot of injuries at that time. I had two stress fractures and a herniated disc in my lower back. Mm. Uh, and Craig had just had um, one year prior had surgery to repair a torn rotator cuff. So we lost a lot of training time, but we still showed up at nationals and we felt like we had a chance to qualify for the Olympics. And unfortunately we finished third and only two teams could go to the Olympics. So for the second Olympics in a row, I found myself as the alternate right. instead of being at the Olympics. I was watching it from my couch. Mm. Um, and really then I knew Craig was not going to continue because the whole reason we skated together was just for the Olympics. He was older than me. He wanted to retire and move on with his life. And he had already been to the Olympics in 2006 okay. with a different partner. So he retired and, you know, I didn't see any other option for me but to retire as well. So that's what I thought I was going to do. Um, but one of my coaches, who's now my husband, was really the one that uh, encouraged me to have a tryout with Eric and to give it one last chance at that Olympic dream. Excellent, and obviously, as we'll we'll hear in in a bit, that that was a was a a, a good a good decision. Was that why you got married to him because he was able to convince you to do that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it played some effect into my uh, faith and trust in him. But um, he was the first person that just believed in Eric and I as a team. Um, Eric and I were not very good at the beginning. Uh, not at all. We had a terrible tryout and uh, Bruno had a vision and he believed in it. And Eric and I kind of just rode on that uh, in our early time of our career. Mm. So it is all about chemistry, the connection with your partner in the skating. I'd, I'd imagine like any anything you can have to connect quite well. So you said, what, what was the original challenges? Was it styles? What what was the, the early blocks? Um. Well, styles were were a little bit difficult i'm very um athletic and dynamic and uh, strong technically and eric uh kind of lacked that athletic grit and he was a little bit more graceful and balletic and longer lines he's uh six foot two and i'm four foot eleven so obviously when we stretched our lines never matched they never could my legs were so much shorter than him um and also we had a big challenge with figuring out our timing on elements because of our size difference. A lot of people think that um, it's a lot easier for a guy to lift a girl if she's so small and short, but it actually provided a lot of challenges for Eric and I with our timing with each other because we had a completely different timing on each of our elements that we had to learn. And how quickly did things start to gel with, with the two of you? When did you start to see was it initial signs of progress and then d did it again continue on quickly or, or was it a ongoing work oh it was ongoing work for eight years but um <laughs> in about a month after starting to skate together we started to realize that we could do things that no other pair team in the world could do and that included uh the side by side triple let's jump um the first time eric threw me to do a throw triple i landed it and eric had always skated with girls um, previously that struggled to land their jumps and their throws. So it was the first time that he threw his partner and I was able to land so effortlessly when all, all of his other partners used to struggle so much with that. And um, he always says that he almost cried in that moment. He was like, oh my gosh, that's it. I'm finally going to be successful. Um, but it was really the fact that we were go both good single skaters that was going to set us apart because we could jump side by side like no other pair skaters in the world could and we were going to take that and build a career based on that and that became our strategy and not knowing too much in the details of, of the different types of of jumps myself you said that the triple lutz is is that something that was you know in in in, in the levels of 
difficulty unmatchable by other other partners is that what you said that wasn't just being done by anyone yeah, else yeah and in the eight years that uh, eric and i competed we were the only ones to land them in competition so that obviously gives you a huge advantage i guess when you can land that big advantage yeah wow okay very, very cool and and you said eric himself was a single skater what was his previous career like had he it's gone to the olympics had he been successful as, as a single um, no, well, he was successful as a single, but not at the Olympic level. Okay. Um, we were both junior national champions of Canada in singles. Um, he didn't compete at the junior worlds uh, like I did in singles or at very many international events, but he was successful within Canada. Um, and he had had uh, various partners before me as well. But he was always held back um, by his previous partner's lack of technical ability. His part, he he never skated with his with a girl that could land jumps like him, or that could land throws. And without those key elements, no matter how great their other, their style was or their look was, they couldn't be successful um, in competition. Hmm. Interesting, cool. Okay, so so just to maybe even jump to to the point for the next four seasons, I see it, it's been gradual continual success and then it it led to 2014 which was the winter olympics in in sochi you you Mm -hmm. you realized your 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 lifetime ambition to to uh to get there what was i suppose what was that whole experience like what what stands out for you and even as a result of finishing i think you said you finished um, seventh in that did that just give you Mm -hmm. more determination than ever that you wanted another go at this Well, in those first four years leading into Sochi, Eric and I had like a natural progression. We were seventh at the world championships, then fifth, and then third. So we entered the Olympics being ranked third in the world. So we thought we had a chance at winning an Olympic medal. Right. Um, And that changed our focus. For the first time in our career, we became focused on a result. Um, The previous years, we were always focused on personal improvement and personal goals. So we got a little bit carried away in 2014 in Sochi being worried about a result and a placement instead of just our own personal best skate. Mm. Um, So we had a great Olympic experience, but we didn't skate our best at the Olympics and we got off the ice feeling disappointed and regret. And for me, that was the worst feeling because all my life since I was telling people I was going to go to the Olympics and I was six years old, I had this vision of, an an amazing Olympic moment in my head. Mm. Like athletes I saw on TV that were at the Olympics and they did a personal best and they were so excited on the grandest stage in the world. Mm. And when I left Sochi, I felt so much disappointment in myself because I didn't, I didn't do it in the moment. I, and I knew why I didn't do it. I didn't do it because I was so focused on a result instead of just my, my own personal goals. And, um, you know, I left the Olympics and I wasn't sure if I wanted to go to another Olympics because I was feeling so upset about the performance that we had. But then after a little bit of reflection, I realized that I had achieved everything I wanted in my skating career. I had been a national champion, a world medalist. I went to the Olympics, which was my ultimate goal. Mm. But the last thing missing was that great Olympic moment, that great skate at the Olympics. So in the time between the 2014 Olympics and the 2018 Olympics, that became the focus to go back to the Olympics and have a great performance regardless of a result Mm. because in skating, we can't control the results. It doesn't matter if, you know, imagine in a track and field, if you run the fastest, but they still say you don't win. Skating doesn't work like that. The judges are deciding who's the best. Yeah. It doesn't matter. uh, It's out of our hands. Wow. So I really uh, entered the 2018 Olympics more focused on, being proud of myself and being happy when I got off the ice. Okay, and that that that's brilliant. Like I was, I'm very interested in psychology and, and and mindset and how you actually change and improve. I suppose the the habits and behaviors to to get to that 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 place. So so when you decided you were going to work towards 2018, and obviously with your coach, I presume this was still Bruno that was the coach, was it? Okay, you put a you put a four year plan or a three year plan in place to to peak at twenty eighteen. What were the tools or or practices that you started to work on to change that mindset 
so that it was more about peaking and skating as opposed to the result? Well, what ended up happening in that moment was we didn't make a plan for four years or three years or two years. Okay. We would make a plan day by day by day. In the moment and stuff, yeah. I had lived in this Olympic cycle these four years that athletes at the Olympic level, you live by Olympic cycles. So in 2002 till 2006, I was living in this cycle, four years getting ready for the Olympics. And then from 2006 to 2010, I did it. And then from 2010 to 2014, I did it. And then I was, you know, after 2014, I was sick of living in this four-year Olympic cycle. And it became more about the moment. What mm. can I do today to be better tomorrow? Okay. And then tomorrow came. What can I do today to be better tomorrow? And it didn't matter what competition we were doing. That was the most important at the time. No matter if it was just a local summer competition or it was the world championships. And that it was just a focus of putting one foot in front of the other. Mm. One foot in front of the other. And that's what we did for two years after the Olympics in Sochi. And during that time, we learned a throw quad sow cow, which um, a few teams have done it in the world, but it's very, very rare. And Eric and I decided that we wanted to learn that. And along with our triple lutzes, side by side, have this throw quad sow, and that would take us to the top. Wow. And uh, we were able to master the throw quad sow, and for two years, we won the world title, two years in a row. Because of, and I really credit that, those world titles to our mindset of just wanting to be better every single day and enjoying the process. Mm. And then after winning our second world title, we got lost again. We got lost with our mental focus on what our goals were, um, what we were striving for. We became scared to lose. And when you get scared to lose, what do you do? <laughs> you lose because that's what you're focusing on. Mm hmm uh, so, so the 2017 season before these uh, last Olympics was the most challenging, I think, of my entire skating career. You started to get scared to lose. The mindset maybe shifted so coming out of that season. Was there again a point to say, I don't have it in me to get even to the Olympics at that stage? And then did you just revert back to that moment by moment, day by day focus? Yes. I mean, there was many times... Um, especially after winning our second world title in 2016. Um, I remember going home and thinking and telling my husband, who is also our coach, I think we should retire right now. It's never going to be better than this. We're on top of the world. We had a great skate. We've been landing that throw quad, sow cow. Um, I really thought that we should retire because all I envisioned was us dropping. Right. And, and that's exactly what we did. Um, my husband, you know, we, we talked about it and reflected on it. And, uh, you know, I came to the conclusion that I loved to train. I loved to compete. And I would still love it if I didn't win. So why wouldn't I continue until the next Olymp until the Olympics, which was only a few years later, um, if I was loving what I was doing? There wasn't anything else I wanted to do with my life. Hmm. Um. But what happened was, as I was regaining my motivation, Eric was losing his more and more and more. And that's uh, the fun part about working on a team. <laughs> it didn't matter how I felt if my partner was not on the exact same page as me. And where did sports psychology and, and kind of work in that space come in here? Was it even more than just your, your coach? Was there others coming in to, to kind of help you both get into that that kind of mindset um you know it was mostly our coaches that worked in this aspect for many years and then last last summer as we were getting ready for the olympics the olympics were coming in eight months and we were still at that low we couldn't find our motivation well as a team we couldn't find the right motivation together we felt lost with our goals um you know we had a we had so much like float in floating. It mm. felt like I was just floating all the time, mm. not set in a path and driven the way I had been my entire life. Um, so I had uh, enlisted the help of a mental trainer eight months before the Olympics and worked with her on my own. 
to reset my direction, to redefine my goals and to keep me on the path, focusing solely on the task at hand. Um, almost like a, like a computer and trying to remove the emotions and focusing on the task more analytically. Hmm. I'm big into meditation. I talk about it a lot. I've interviewed a lot of people about it. it did that kind of, when you talk about in the moment, that's very much in kind of a meditative state. Was there, mm -hmm. was there an approach or a tool or a technique? Did your mental coach help you with that? Was there anything specific that, that, you were practicing to, to stay there because you know that voice inside your head that negative self-talk that comes in into me probably every 10 minutes I'm not sure so much with you you sound very positive and, and focused but uh how did you deal with that and what were the kind of techniques even that your mental coach brought to the table well, I had already been doing a lot of meditation on my own, so I continued doing that okay. and she did some um, hypnotherapy sessions with me okay. Uh, and we worked, we worked with meditations and guided meditations and, um, guided scripts where I would record myself hmm. speaking and I could listen to the recording of myself. So it was like, a um, a guided script or a guided meditation coming from my own voice. Yeah. And I would have it recorded on my phone and I could listen to that in moments that I felt stress. And this was extremely helpful to me. Um, I would listen to it right before I stepped on the ice at the Olympics, at the national championships, in training when I felt stressed. And uh, that was a big tool that I used to help me. Oh, very good. Because obviously the, the voice inside your head normally that's talking to you generally is not the one that's giving you all the positive stuff. It's probably telling you the reason <laughs> you can't do it. So counteracting that with your own voice in a positive in a positive approach sounds like a really good tool so maybe I'll, I'll do that this weekend and see how, how I get on with that I'm conscious of your time as well and I just want to wrap up with a few more so obviously the the key one is the Olympics you got there and you you won gold so so it, did it all go to plan was there you know anything during that that stood out that uh, made it very clear that this was meant to be do you believe in that sort of thing yeah um well we actually we won the gold and a bronze medal because we competed in two different events at yep. the olympics um and we showed up at the olympics in the best shape of our life physically mentally and emotionally mm -hmm. we had been training really well going into the olympics we felt very confident but very calm and it was nice because we went into the Olympics as underdogs. We were seventh in the world the year before. Um, you know, we we weren't as successful in the year leading into the Olympics as we had been. And a lot of people counted us out. Mm. And Eric and I felt very comfortable in that position. No one was talking about us. The media wasn't interested in us. So we could just kind of fly under the radar and do our own business. And we really, really liked being in that position. We were going to the Olympics and we knew that we would have to compete four times in one week. And that's something that we had never done before. The Olympics was the first time that we would ever do that. Right. Um, but we knew going into the Olympics that that's what we were going to do. So we had prepared mentally and physically to do that. And I can say that everything went absolutely according to plan. I couldn't have scripted it any better. Um, we competed in the team event first. And our goal was to skate very well, but to leave ourselves room to improve in the individual pairs competition. And I mean, that's exactly what we did. And we went into our individual pairs long program where we won the bronze medal. And I've never stepped on the ice to compete, feeling more relaxed and settled in my life. And it actually scared uh, Eric and I, because as we were going on the ice, I told Eric, because usually we, we talk about how nervous we feel when mm. we're trying to calm each other down. But as we were stepping on the ice, I said, Eric, I'm really calm. I feel really relaxed. And he got so excited. He told me, I feel the exact same way. Thank you so much for bringing it up. I was getting scared because I felt so relaxed. Uh. So Then we had a little laugh and we were like, wow, isn't it funny? We're going into the biggest moment of our lives. A chance to skate for an Olympic medal it was our last performance as competitive athletes and we were just feeling so calm and it's not how I expected that that would happen. And we said, well, let's go with it. Let's see what happens. We didn't try to force anything. We just mm -hmm. let it be. We exhaled and 
we had a great performance and it felt so comfortable and so calm. Wow. It, it was like effortless, I'd imagine, by the, the sounds of it. That's exactly what it felt like. And throughout my entire career, I've always struggled with overthinking. Mm-hmm. I'm very analytical and I'm always thinking. My mind is always going. It's adding up points. Um, Even during the performance? Yes. Right. A lot of the times. Um, I really have to, str- I really struggle to turn off my brain while I'm skating. And for one of the few times in my skating career, that's what happened at the Olympics. I turned off my brain and I didn't force it. It was just all so organic and so natural. It's like the, the state of flow athletes like to say. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. And it's that um, that that switch or whatever it was that turned off the brain is something I'd, I'd love to find that, that, that myself. It, it, it's what just comes up for me. I interviewed a, a lady from Ireland, from Cork, from Cork actually, um, not so long ago. Olive Loch Nan, and she was, she got the gold for the 50, 40 kilometer walk in um, 2009 Berlin World Championships. And it's funny because the parallel of what you described there is what she described on the day that she just knew mm-hmm. it was going to be her day and that was it. And, and she was more relaxed than ever. And, you know, it's, um, it's interesting. You probably talk to a lot of other people that have been successful and won golds and maybe talk, talk similar stories of just everything falling into place. So, yeah. So no, it's, and we could yeah. feel it leading into the Olympics. I mean, when we were at home and we were training and we were talking to people about the Olympics, I c- we could feel something was building. Mm. Everything felt right, and something was building, and it was le- it was going to lead us to greatness. We had no doubt. Mm. We just weren't sure what the judges were going to do with us because we had struggled for almost two years. Yeah. So we didn't know what the judges going to reward us when we have these great skates. And I mean, that was out of our control. So we didn't focus on that, but it allowed us not to worry about a medal because we didn't know if the judges would reward us for a medal. So for us, a medal meant having a great skate for ourselves. Yeah. And and obviously that's exactly what you, you guys did. So, so brilliant. It was fascinating to hear mm-hmm. that, that mindset working, going there. That's where, where I love uh, getting into to the stories. I'm conscious we didn't talk just maybe just for a few minutes in 2008 or 2009. You said you became a vegan. How did was how did that come about? And then how did your training and obviously your diet had to change? How did that all come together to keep you at that top level from a you know from a physical perspective? Yeah, um, I mean, I had a very smooth transition into becoming a vegan. Um, I'm one of the crazy ones. I did it cold turkey. I was not a vegetarian. I was not a health food fanatic. I read a book about the vegan diet one night and I said, this sounds interesting. I'm going to try it. And I cleaned out my fridge and decided to be vegan. (laughs) Um, So it's a little bit of an unconventional way to go about it. Um, But that's kind of how I've how I've attacked my life. Um, My coach at the time, one of my other coaches, not my not my eventual husband, but one of my other coaches and my skating partner, Craig, both told me, you're going to be malnutritioned. All Mm. those vegans are so pale and weak and malnutritioned. And when people um, responded that way to me, it made me want to do it more. (laughs) I was like, I'm going to prove you wrong. I'm going to be the healthiest vegan you've ever seen. Uh. Uh, And, uh, you know, I discovered throughout that process that I had a passion for animals that I didn't know I had and a passion for food and healthy living that I, I wasn't aware I had either. Um, and eventually it led me to studying holistic nutrition and having a certification as a holistic nutritionist now. So I'm so thankful to that, uh, moment that I was crazy enough to think I was going to become a vegan because it's led me to such amazing things in my life that I would have never, I would have never studied holistic nutrition or fell into this path if I wasn't a vegan. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's very cool. And you have a a, a site out now. It's called it's lots of greens, but spelled lots of greens, right? Exactly. Yeah, lots of greens. Um, it's a play on uh, the on, triple. On the triple. The I'm just skating. after that's just after clicking with me there now as well. So yeah, I get it. I've, I've learned <laughs> yeah. a lot about ice skating. So in instead the of lots of greens, uh, my little play on that with <laughs> lots of greens, which is a. Uh, 
it was my husband's idea. He's got great ideas. I can't take credit for it. That was Creative. that was him that came up with it. <laughs> Very good. And and the future. So there, there's there's that element in your your uh, your future. Obviously, the coaching that uh, that we can attribute to your 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 voice at the moment. Um, mm-hmm. Do you see yourself training potential uh, Olympians in in the future? Oh, I would love to. I've started getting into coaching now. Um, I would love to to continue and share my passion with others in the skating world. And I mean, it doesn't have to be people at the Olympic level. Um, I'm coaching skaters of all levels, some younger skaters that they're just passionate and they want to be the best they can be. And if I can help them reach their potential and be the best they can be, then I'm going to be happy and proud of them. Mm, Very good. Can I wrap up with just two very rapid fire questions that I'd like to ask? Um, Yep. One one is just is there a saying or a phrase or a or a cliche that that you kind of live by or or one that you use on a regular basis? Does anything come up for you when I say that? Yeah, it's it's really cliche. Everybody always says to enjoy the journey. It's all about the journey and not the destination. And you know, I made it to the ultimate destination. And what do I think about and look back on is the journey. Mm. Is the amazing journey I had. That's what I see when I look at my Olympic medals. And, um, you know, people say it all the time and it's cliche, but it's really true to enjoy the moment and enjoy the journey. Mm. And cliches stick around because they are very true. So definitely that's good. And you mentioned one book already around the vegan, but I, I do like to ask for a book recommendation. Is there is there any one that you read along the way that maybe along your journey that motivated you that, you know, at times when there's maybe darkness or or not so many positive ideas that inspired you to keep going anything come up for you there um one book it's a sports psychology book that you know i've reread so many times in my career it's called mind gym um so training your mind just like you train at the gym and it's a small book um written by some people some experts in the sports psychology world and uh, i always found myself going back to that when i was trying to get my head together and uh, improve my mental game okay brilliant well I, I'll, I'll include uh include both of those is there any book on on the horizon for yourself for your own story for your own journey you know what yes um we eric and i have a book coming out this fall it's called soulmates on ice oh. and uh, it's available right now to be pre-ordered on amazon Oh, brilliant. Excellent. Well, I'll definitely include that in uh, in the notes of the show when I, when I put it out. So so folks can can go Thank onto you. Amazon and, and uh, do that. Megan, look, it was brilliant to catch up. Um, I'm delighted we got the chance to do it. And it was, it was really interesting and enjoyable to hear your story. I've t- taken a few things from it. Um, I like you. your, your very positive. I think if I said you can't do something, I think you would obviously just go and do it then. So I'm not going to put <laughs> you up to anything like that. Best of luck in your in your new endeavors and your new career. Thank and uh, it was great, great to chat. Thank you so much. I'll talk to you later. Talk to you again. Take care, Megan. Bye. Have a good day. So how did you find it? A good show? Hopefully. Do take a second or two to let me know. And before you do, dive off. Just a couple of quick call-outs. The new podcast, the 864, 15 minutes long, in fact, 864 seconds is the aspiration, is now out and ready for listening. Check it out on the site. Go to the podcast page. There's a link for 864 there. Or go on to Apple Podcasts and subscribe. That would be awesome. The 864 is all you have to search for. And it's in all other podcast platforms that you can think of or should be. So, have a listen. Every week I release a One Minute Monday video clip which is also a tip to hopefully make you one percent better check that out it's on the website on the video page did you also know that only about one percent of listeners to podcasts not just my own but all leave a rating leave a review get in touch or give feedback and i would love if we could book that trend and put it to two percent for this one so please do take the time to give me a bit of feedback give me some ideas about future guests or whatever the hell comes into mind just get in touch or rate or review the podcast on apple that helps i'm available at all of the social platforms pretty much all at rob of the green that's either with or without the at sign but you'll find it under that moniker so hopefully i'll hear from you there last couple of quick ones support so i do offer some pro bono coaching get onto the website the support page to get in touch few hours a month happy to do that and if you would like to support the podcast that would be awesome you can do so 
through Patreon and also through purchasing books through the book page on the website that goes through Amazon and we get a little percentage I'm not even sure what but it's something and finally just to say thanks for taking the time to listen to the podcast I know there's lots of other shows out there it means a lot that you're checking this one out so have a great rest of day week month year whatever it may be and hopefully you're getting one percent better as a result of these shows take care and good luck